That phone in your pocket right now might be a government spying device, according to a stunning article from the Guardian newspaper in the UK. The story says a top secret court order is forcing Verizon to turn over all phone records for calls made in the U.S. to the National Security Agency, and not just calls made to overseas numbers. When you call grandma in Nebraska, the NSA knows. This is a wide, indiscriminate net. They're not even looking for someone specific. When a call is made, Verizon turns over this information. The phone number, phone serial numbers, the location the call comes from, the time of the call, the duration of the call, and all the same information for the person on the other end of the phone, even if they're not a Verizon customer. And if you move from one tower range to another, you can be tracked. Pretty much everything about the call, except what's actually being said, is turned over under the order from the secret Foreign Intelligence Surveillance, or FISA, court. Given that, it would not take much to figure out who you are. Without exactly confirming or denying the FISA order, Deputy White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest defended the idea behind it today. The information of the sort described in the article has been a critical tool, he said, in protecting the nation from terror threats. This order reportedly extends from April 25th to July 19th, but it seems to be just a continuation of a court order that's been going on for seven years, one Congress has known all about. The Republican chairman of the House Select Committee on Intelligence today called it a vital tool. Within the last few years, this program was used uh, to stop a program, or excuse me, stop a terrorist attack in the United States. We know that. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. It fills in a little seam that we have, and it's used to make sure that there is not an international nexus to any uh, terrorism event that they may believe is ongoing in the United States. So in that regard, it is a very valuable thing. And in all likelihood, this court order to Verizon is just the only one we know about. You know who would, re you know who would be really angry about this government snooping? A bright-eyed senator from Illinois, I remember, who was upset when a similar story about the NSA grabbing phone data for millions of Americans was reported during the Bush years. He said this in 2007. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens. No more national security letters to spy on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. No more tracking citizens who do nothing more than protest a misguided war. So instead, let's track every citizen? One member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence who has been briefed on these practices and clearly upset, although until today we were not really sure what he was upset about because he could not tell us, is Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat from Oregon. On March 12th, about a month and a half before this current order was signed, Wyden seemed to be trying to get the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, to admit that this kind of NSA operation was going on. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. If the order uncovered by The Guardian is merely a renewal, as the chairwoman of the Senate Intelligence Committee today indicated, then shouldn't Clapper's answers have been yes and quite wittingly? Clapper's office today did not respond to a request for comment. Yes, I was talking to a friend about trainers. People were talking about a watch. Holiday. Paper towel. Car. And we were talking about the design of the trainers and the name of the brand of the trainers. And I went onto my, feed, uh, my Instagram and within 5-10 minutes it was one of the adverts that popped up on there. It seems everyone's got a story like this. Strange instances that make us ask are our phones and apps listening to our conversations? I'm sure there is someone who is listening right now, even right now. For years though, the big tech companies have denied this is happening. Uh, yes or no, does Facebook use audio obtained from mobile devices to enrich personal information about its users? No. And still the conspiracies rage. But now a cybersecurity company has carried out a thorough scientific study to look into it. Mobile security experts at Wondera took four phones, two identical Samsung Androids and two identical iPhones, all with major apps like Facebook Open. They kept two in silence, the other two were played a series of pet food adverts at the same time over three days. 
They didn't record any related advertising and no technical evidence of listening. Just look at the data phones use when voice assistants like Siri and Google are activated. Compare that to the tiny amounts of data used when the apps are idle. Hiding any meaningful transfer of data would be impossible. Research, I think, were pretty conclusive that none of these companies are actually listening in surreptitiously to our conversations and then using that to target ads at us. Um, there was some background um, activity on these devices. It's usually location updates and various other kind of uh, data that's being sent to servers belong to these companies. So as the CEO of a cybersecurity firm, you're prepared to put your neck on the line and say they're not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would put my, I would put my name to it, but obviously, you know, if they're doing something that we haven't in our research uncovered, then it is possible. I think it's very unlikely though. The results won't surprise those who study phone security. And I went onto my, feed, uh, my Instagram and- really They may calm some of the conspiracy theorists, but the truth is perhaps just as troubling. Uh, the ads that you see, they, they don't only, they, they come through a variety of information that has been accumulated about you over a long period of time. There are rapid advancements in machine learning technologies where we can now predict what you are interested in according to your past searches and your past behavior. There are, of course, well-documented examples of dodgy apps that do secretly listen to our conversations, as well as government spy tools used to snoop on high-level targets. But this research points to a perhaps more troubling truth. The big tech companies probably aren't listening to us because they don't need to. Joe Tidy, BBC News. By 2050, cyborgs will be serving in the US Army. The cyborgs will have incredible eyesight and hearing, telepathic abilities, and phenomenal endurance. Could it be that maybe American scientists are already nursing a new kind of people, the X-Men in their secret laboratories? Ominous experiments on embryos have nothing to do with it. With the help of the latest technologies, it's planned to turn ordinary people into universal super fighters. So, what will these hybrids of man and machine look like? What challenges will they face? For a soldier, eyesight is the main source of strategic information. It's not surprising that the military is searching for ways to improve it. These days, soldiers have to work in the dark with bulky and rather heavy night vision goggles. However, the company Rockwell Collins has offered an alternative in the form of a new augmented reality system, IDVS, Integrated Digital Vision System. The system is built into the helmets and provides more detailed information about the battlefield and the enemy. Data from the command center, other fighters, or drones is displayed on a transparent projection screen with a resolution of 1920 by 1200 pixels right in front of the soldier's eyes. The IDVS also allows you to view interactive maps, mark strategically important objects on the go, and instantly transfer information to others. Multi-spectral sensors increase visibility in bad weather conditions, and four rechargeable batteries provide up to six hours of battery life. Other potential solutions are contact lenses with the same capabilities, plus digital zoom and the latest Striker 2 helmet-mounted display, HMD, Helmet for Fighter Pilots. The helmet's capability was demonstrated by the British defense company BAE Systems in July 2019. The helmet provides surround sound, a tracking system for targets, and night vision. The pilot can see through the airplane with the help of cameras on the airplane's body. All this technology facilitates military missions and provides an advantage in aerial combat. At the same time, the device weighs less than similar systems. One of the most extreme options would be the surgical implantation of various eye modifications. People are unlikely to agree to the removal of healthy parts of their visual system. Therefore, such an operation to install high-tech equipment in the body will probably be carried out only in cases of illness or injury to the eyes. In exchange for ordinary vision, 
a person will be able to see the entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Despite efforts to reduce the weight of equipment, soldiers, like all people, still get tired. However, they don't always have the opportunity to get good rest. In this regard, scientists suggest a restorative or optogenetic bodysuit. This special suit will quickly relieve tension from aching muscles and in a shorter period of time will restore soldiers' strength. Sensors that are located on a mesh suit fitting tightly against their bodies will monitor muscle condition. The sensors stimulate the nerve cells with programmed light pulses. Moreover, the technology acts on the entire nervous system as well as on individual neural connections. The suit will not only reduce the time needed to rest and increase the endurance of the soldier, but will also help fighters who have lost some functions of their muscular and nervous system due to trauma. These cybernetic muscles will not only work better than soldiers' own muscles prior to injury, but will also allow them to control drones and various weapons remotely. It's possible that the soldier's entire uniform will also be smart. For example, there are already shirts that can change color depending on lighting or temperature. The same technology is used to create clothes that can change color on demand rather than through passive stimuli. Such a property would help soldiers to remain inconspicuous in any conditions. There are early prototypes for this kind of technology. Researchers have developed a yarn that has copper wire in the center sheathed by a sleeve made by a type of polymer. The polymer sheath is laced with pigments which are already used in the technology of color-changing shirts. The copper wire allows the user to slightly change the temperature of the pigment, thereby changing its color. If the microcontroller knows the exact pattern of the textile, it'll be able to create specific patterns all across the fabric. As technology improves, sensors will become smaller and smaller until they start to be woven directly into the fabric. It may get to the point when the soldiers will be able to recharge gadgets from their clothes. The human body generates various types of energy. In everyday life, it's the thermal energy and kinetic energy of movement. So. One watt is produced with each breath. You can power a 60-watt light bulb and even a telephone by walking slowly. You can produce up to 2,000 watts when sprinting. The invention of researchers at Vanderbilt University has the greatest chance to develop into a walking charging station. This small device can be placed directly on the clothes and collect the energy of even the most minor human movements. Hearing is another aspect that's planned for improvement. There are two equally important approaches, improvement of hearing and its protection from extreme noise, explosions, and shooting. Nowadays, soldiers wear bulky, noise-canceling ear protection. A compact headset would be much more useful, but scientists have gone further and proposed to endow the soldiers with cybernetic ears. Such devices will not only improve hearing and help to detect important sounds from the surroundings, but also to access a voice network and communication. This is comparable to implanting a smartphone in the ear, complete with the functions of translation into foreign languages in real time. Also, the innovations will allow one to distinguish between ultra-low frequency oscillations, infrasound, and ultra-high frequency ultrasound and will protect against traumatically loud sounds. The best way to do this is by implanting electrodes which will interface with neural pathways. You can remove them with minimal adverse effects. Hearing loss is a serious problem in the Army. Therefore, psychologically, soldiers will probably find it easier to go for such a minor surgical procedure rather than an operation on the eyes or muscles.
the expansion of brain capabilities with neuro implants offering the possibility of two-way data exchange is the most revolutionary technology by far. It will allow soldiers to instantly exchange data without communication devices, as well as remotely control any equipment and weapons. American inventor Elon Musk has already been working on one area of implementation of this technology with the Neuralink brain implant. This year, it's planned to implant the first such neural interfaces from thin polymer threads into people. At DARPA, the U.S. Department of Defense's Advanced Research Projects Agency, they've been working on neural implant technology for many years. Such a combination of a human soldier and a machine is likely to require a major operation. Therefore, researchers suggest that such neural interfaces be given only to elite fighters, such as the Navy SEALs. Cybernetic innovations are way ahead of the legal and ethical framework of society. And for that reason, they're raising a lot of questions. For example, is a person, after merging with a machine, still a person or part of the equipment? When captured, should they hope to be protected by the Geneva Convention? Is it ethical to remove the enhanced muscles, which allow a wounded soldier to move around? Probably, the answers to most of these questions will be given after the fact. An additional complication is that the concept of cyborg in society is largely demonized. Although, in fact, a cyborg is any person into whose body an artificial device was implanted to expand their physical capabilities. For example, a person with a hearing aid. Is it possible to stop the development of technology? According to Elon Musk, a person cannot be smarter than a supercomputer, and since there's no way to defeat it, we'll need to join together with them. Would you agree to become a cyborg? What abilities would you like to improve first? If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell to enable notifications of new videos, and don't forget to recommend us to your friends. Until next time. What do history, love, and meteor showers have to do with each other? In the United States, they've all been labeled as threatening. Why? Well, the reason is censored. Episode 4, American Exceptionism. How the U.S. government works, or really how it doesn't work, is outlined by its constitution. The First Amendment states Congress shall make no laws prohibiting freedoms of religion, speech, press, and assembly. It doesn't grant these freedoms, it assumes they exist and promises not to get directly in their way. It's a subtle difference. Sometimes. Freedom of speech in the U.S. applies to everyone. The only exceptions have to do with threats. Only the government can make those. Even George Washington considered unflattering truths about himself to be a threat to the nation, so he had his wife Martha destroy them. It would not be the last time a Washington wife lied to make the little people safer. Keeping with that tradition, the U.S. has continued to censor perceived threats. From 1837 to 1967, miscegenation, an archaic term for an interracial relationship, was illegal in Texas. Even talking about it was illegal. But in 1942, Cherokee Maiden, a love song about a white cowboy romancing a First Nations woman, became a country standard. So why wasn't Cherokee Maiden censored in Texas? Huh. Well, one could argue those laws were never really about all race mixing in general. African-American artists already knew that racial laws were biased against them specifically. To avoid persecution, they used subtext. Brown-eyed, handsome man from 1956 doesn't overtly mention interracial romance, just that white women love a brown, <coughs> eyed man. In 1967, the Supreme Court ruled that all anti-miscegenation laws were violations of the 14th Amendment, which had supposedly guaranteed equal rights and due process to former slaves. Irma Jackson, about an interracial couple who knew their relationship was taboo, was written by a white artist in 1969 after anti-miscegenation laws had been ruled unconstitutional. It was still censored, but not by the government. Columbia Records thought its customers still, quote unquote, weren't ready for interracial love songs. American companies censor themselves to preserve profits all the time. 
The Constitution not only doesn't prevent this, it protects it as the company's right. Social change is uncomfortable, and here in the United States, we have a tradition of not distinguishing the difference between discomfort and danger. In 1985, a group of prominent Washington wives, led by Tipper Gore, formed the Parents Music Resource Center. Everywhere they look, the Washington wives saw references to sex, violence, and Satanism. The PMRC even released a list of the music they most objected to, dubbed the Filthy 15. And it worked. Retailers began agreeing to not sell albums those Washington wives objected to, and record companies agreed to start labeling ones with objectionable material. But before those labels became official, in 1985 there was an open Senate hearing on the subject. At the hearing, Tipper Gore and the PMRC made their case against what they called porn rock. <laughs> Sex, drugs, violence, and the occult had taken over music in America. Gosh. Dee Snyder, lead singer of famed hair metal band Twisted Sister, had a song on the PMRC's Filthy 15, but argued that his work was often misinterpreted. The song Under the Knife had been cited by Mrs. Gore as containing references to sadomasochism, bondage, and rape. Mr. Snyder, the author of the song, informed the U.S. Senate that it was actually about surgery. Tipper Gore had labeled the song obscene, though, and she found what she was looking for regardless. When the PMRC saw John Denver, lead singer of John Denver, at the hearings, they assumed he was there to take their side, but he wasn't. Rocky Mountain High had been pulled from radio stations for supposedly being about drug use, but Mr. Denver wrote it about watching a meteor shower. He also noted that by labeling some albums as dangerous, it would only create a taboo and actually increase their desirability. Also in attendance was musical pioneer Frank Zappa, who pointed out that traditionally, First Amendment issues are decided with a preference for minimal restriction. This wasn't just about music, this was about a radical misuse of government. Despite a stampede of reasons they were a bad idea, the PMRC got their explicit lyrics labels, because Tipper Gore's paranoid misinterpretations of popular songs were the sort of expertise Americans listened to. Or, as Mr. Zappa once put it, America is a nation of laws, poorly written and randomly enforced. Just like with anti-miscegenation laws, tipper stickers, as they came to be known, were selectively applied disproportionately to African Americans. What a surprise. Big record labels regularly caution artists about the financial dangers of receiving a warning label. Dangers to the record company mostly, because... As it turns out, taboos really are attention-grabbing. In the early 1990s, Me So Horny was a song that shocked lots of listeners. But the extra attention that the explicit lyrics labels brought allowed the artist to bypass big record companies completely. And so censorship was forever a thing of the past in the United States of America, and law enforcement never overstepped its boundaries again. Ha! <laughs> Fuck no, are you kidding me? The United States offers the greatest legal protection of free speech in the world, but legal protection is only theoretical until it's enforced. There will always be gaps in enforcement, but in America, those gaps engulf whole communities. Selective enforcement turns laws into the teeth of prejudice. Labels allow groups to be targeted in plain sight, and a systemic confusion between danger and discomfort makes it all legal. Of course, all this happened back in the 20th century. What happened to American culture and laws next? Uh, a couple things. Wanna like censored? Sure. Wanna subscribe? Great. Wanna comment? Sorry. We'll talk about YouTube's censorious policies in a future episode, but for now, if you have something to say, we recommend make your own cartoon. No one is gonna do that, guys. It's a beautiful thought. Next time on Censored, what do secret identities, body hair, and opinions you don't agree with have in common? Aw, oh, I remember college. There are also things you won't see on Facebook. Wait, Facebook? Hey, I thought we only did countries on this show. No, no, we're, we're switching it up. Companies, too. Shit.